All right, so now we're going to talk about hydrogen and carbon nucleophiles. Um, we have actually learned back in chapter 12. Oh, I'll sort of link this in this lecture slide, chapter 12, the reduction of aldehydes and ketones to form alcohols. We learned about two reducing agents, lithium aluminum hydride, the book calls it LAH, and sodium borohydride, okay? Um, as far as we're concerned, these guys are the same. We're gonna see that lithium in, in like the next chapter, we'll see that lithium aluminum hydride is actually a little bit stronger. So it works more robustly. Both of them work great on aldehydes and ketones. Okay, so both of them will accomplish the same reduction of an aldehyde or ketone to an alcohol. These reactions, hydride reactions are carried out under basic conditions. So what does that mean for our mechanism? We shouldn't see any, what kind of charge? No positive charge in these reaction mechanisms. And in fact, when you hear hydride, I want you to think nucleophilic hydrogens. That's what hydrides are doing for you. They have nucleophilic hydrogens. So that's exactly what's gonna happen here. Our hydrogen is acting as a nucleophile attacking that electrophilic carbonyl carbon that's gonna bump that pair of electrons up onto that oxygen. That's gonna leave us with this deprotonated oxygen. So the last step is it's just gonna to have to grab a proton from somewhere, water or whatever the solvent may be forming our alcohol. Okay, so again, hydride, you think nucleophilic hydrogens, and these are reactions that take place under basic conditions. I just wanted to remind everybody from that same chapter 12, there were two other functional groups that we know react with the lithium aluminum hydride to form alcohols, and those are carboxylic acids and esters, okay? Just like all of our, I don't know why I made a point to point this out on this particular one, but I guess it's good to know. Um, just like all of these reactions, because this carbonyl carbon lays flat in this bond, your nucleophile can approach from either side. And so you're always gonna get a racemic mi mixture of your stereoisomers. But that's honestly the case with all of these ketone and aldehyde reactions. Uh, the carbon nucleophile that we've talked about, again, this is again in chapter 12, we talked about the Grignard reagent, okay? Super popular reagent. These are all methyl Grignards. I think the thing to remember, well, so let's just take a note about what's happening here. Um, we again have our carbonyl oxygens going to be converted to an alcohol group. And importantly, we have this new carbon-carbon bond that's formed between our Grignard and what was formerly the uh, carbonyl carbon. Um, the cool thing about Grignards, or the thing that makes them so powerful, is in this case, this was a methyl group. It's way too big. This could be just generic group here. There are almost no restrictions on the type of reagent that can be used to create a, um, a Grignard, right? And, the only restriction being it can't have any donatable hydrogens like an amine group or an alcohol group. But besides that, it can be aryl, it can be vinyl, it can be alkyl. Uh, all of those will work to form Grignards. All right, it also works great for either aldehyde or either ketones, which is what we just saw, or aldehydes, same deal. And we're Remember that this is again, sort of just a reminder from chapter 12, we saw that esters will react with Grignard reagents twice, forming two new carbon-carbon bonds and kicking off this half of the your ester as an alcohol. Okay, so just sort of a reminder about how esters also react with Grignard reagents. This is something I wanna point out specifically because we're gonna see here in the next lecture that we can convert ketones and aldehydes to esters, 
So, you know, in terms of multi-step synthesis, that opens up a lot of windows. All right, let's look at the, re, uh, the reaction mechanism here. And I don't actually like how the book did it. So I'm gonna modify it a little bit. It sort of acted as if this is a carbanion, which is how we think about it. But really, if we were drawing the reaction mechanism, we would start with our Grignard, like so, with the MGBR. And it's the electrons in this bond that are going to be your nucleophile attacking that carbonyl carbon. That pair of electrons gets kicked up. And so this is how we get our tetrahedral intermediate. Um, these are basic conditions. Grignards are strong nucleophiles that will react only under basic conditions. And so we, again, our last step is we have this deprotonated oxygen. We have to protonate. So that's why we'll treat with water, whoops, or some source of acid to protonate that oxygen, creating that alcohol group. Another form of carbon nucleophile is the cyano group, okay? So uh, hydrogen cyanide will react with ketones or aldehydes to form cyanohydrins, okay? And then just note, here's my cyanide group, and we've protonated that oxygen, all of which can come from that HCN. These take place under basic conditions, okay? And by that, it's actually relatively close to neutral, but we're gonna think about it as our basic reaction mechanism, which means that we shouldn't see any of what type of charge? No positive charges, okay? Our nucleophile is going to attack, which is the cy uh, cyanide ion, is going to attack that carbonyl carbon and kick that pair of electrons up to the oxygen. Now we're left with our tetrahedral intermediate with the deprotonated oxygen, the alkoxide oxygen. This can go and receive a pro proton from the HCN, okay? Um, you don't need to worry about what's called an acidic workup, basically adding an acid or water to the mixture after that in order to protonate it because you have the HCN that can serve as a proton donor. Uh, because you need to keep this at basic conditions. You never just use HCN by itself. You also use um, potassium cyanide or just another salt, right? So this is just potassium salt with cyanide ion. That sort of by using this mixture ensures that you have a lot of the nucleophilic species, but also your source of proton as well. Oops. Okay, um, so really, I get just to sort of hammer this home here. This is the combination of reagents that we're going to use for these cyanohydrin formation reactions. And they have one sort of added little benefit here, which is we can convert that uh, cyano group to different functional groups. We can either use lithium aluminum hydroxide. Here's this guy coming up again and reduce that to an amine. So notice that this has reduced this nitrogen here to an amine group, okay? Um, or if we take the cyanide group and heat it in acid, we will actually oxidize that cyanocarbon into a carboxylic acid. In both of these cases, you know, we can, we can oxidize an aldehyde to a carboxylic acid. So like, how do we know? What do we don't wanna mess things up? One of the hallmarks of using the cyanohydrin intermediate is you've added exactly one carbon to that carbon, what was formerly the carbonyl carbon. So if you notice in a reaction, you've grown your carbon chain by exactly one and you have one of these new functional groups, this is a good reaction to turn to. Okay. As always, the question, do I need to know the mechanism? So first of all, these reactions here, the hydride, what do you think of when you hear hydride? You think of nucleophilic hydrogen. These take place under basic conditions. And yes, you do need to know the mechanism. 
Same with our Grignard, also take place under basic conditions. And yes, know the mechanism. Our cyanohydrin formation, these take place under basic conditions. And yes, you should know the mechanism. And then we have our last two reactions, which are just sort of fancy ways of converting your cyano group to either an amine group, oops, or a carboxylic acid. Again, in both of these cases, you've added exactly one carbon, but these are not reactions that you have to know the uh, mechanism for.